I'm Julie Bartke with this Senate update. There was a call to action on Wednesday by clean energy advocates to Minnesota lawmakers to implement the National Clean Power Plan. Famed explorer Will Steger was one of several who asked the governor and lawmakers to consider the soon to be released recommendations. Good morning, everyone. We are so pleased to be here to join polar explorer Will Steger and clean energy businesses and advocates from across Minnesota to urge a strong clean power plan in Minnesota. So that's our topic today. My name is Jay Drake Hamilton. I'm the science policy director at Fresh Energy. I'll be your MC today. So I'll be calling on people sequentially as we go forward. Um, not everyone who's up at front will be speaking, but everyone who's up at front, in front will be available to answer questions um, at the end, uh, formally and then informally as you have time. Uh, first of all, a few words about Fresh Energy. We are a 25-year-old private nonprofit. We support clean energy policy in Minnesota and the nation. We're after carbon reduction and a wide variety of markets for clean energy job development across Minnesota that get us cleaner air, cleaner water, and uh, a much healthier environment for everyone in Minnesota. I want to introduce first a couple of people who won't be speaking but are available for your questions because some of them have come from a long way. So we have um, Tim Goulden, who is the owner of Winona Renewable Energy and does work in a broad swath of southeastern Minnesota. Tim Goulden is in the green shirt. We also have Andy Kim, who is the vice president at EVS based in Eden Prairie. Andy is over here, just to the left of, just to the right of Tim. Um, and we have others that I'll introduce um, a little bit later. First of all, we're celebrating Minnesota's clean energy economy today, which provides over 15,300 family supporting jobs in many counties across Minnesota at, by virtue of strong policy that's been developed over the years by the Minnesota legislature. We are calling upon leaders in Minnesota, especially Governor Dayton, members of his administration, and state legislators to implement the Clean Power Plan, which is part uh, the responsible part of the Clean Air Act um, that Minnesota now gets to implement, and uh, that can help continue to grow our clean energy economy. In fact, you'll hear about projections that we could get as many as 35,000 jobs in clean energy by virtue of the Clean Power Plan. It's a powerful solution, that's why we're here. It would limit for the first time carbon pollution uh, that power plants right now can dump for free into our air. The Clean Power Plan is a national plan. It's the single largest action a nation has ever taken, any nation has ever taken, to reduce carbon pollution. It will reduce national electric sector emissions in the United States by an estimated 30% below 2005 levels by the year 2030. It's a big lift. That is the equivalent in pollution benefits of taking 150 million cars off the road. So it's a win-win for everyone in Minnesota and the nation. We are honored to have here today Minnesota's biggest champion for climate action and education, Will Steger. Um, I've known Will for about 12 years, I think now, polar explorer Will Steger. Um, was uh, the first eyewitness from Minnesota of um, the effects of climate change and the impacts at both poles. And he started to take action back here at home and across the nation. 10 years ago, he founded a nonprofit organization which is now called Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy. And they are a primary sponsor of this event tonight. Um, and the purpose of, cl of Climate Generation is to work with Minnesotans to call all Minnesotans of this joint set of generations to action, effective action on climate change. Will Steger has been a headliner at literally thousands of community events across Minnesota. I've had a privilege of being at some of them. We had one just last night at the Science Museum. And um, Will is here today to call for the next needed steps to ensure a clean energy future under the Clean Power Plan in Minnesota. So I'll bring forward Will Steger. Thank you, Will. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming out, and um, Jay, thanks. It's been a pleasure working with you these last uh, 12 years. Uh, in 1990, uh, the carbon dioxide level reached 350 parts per million, and uh, this is the level where the ice started melting. And I've been on the ice in the last 25 years as it started to melt. All the ice shelves that I've crossed in Antarctica and 
uh, northern Arctic have disintegrated. This includes the Larsen B ice shelf and Larsen A, 300 miles across, size of, almost the size of Minnesota, disintegrated in 2002. Um, I've witnessed the, and been on the rapid ice melt of the Arctic Ocean. Um, it's no longer possible to reach the North Pole by dog team. Within a couple years, it'll be no longer possible even to reach it by uh, hauling a sled. The ice is rapidly leaving uh, in the summer, melting. And I've, I've also experienced Greenland, uh, incredible warm up on that huge 1,600-mile uh, long island. Uh, two years ago, for the first time, uh, we had thaw levels that went up to 10,400 feet. Uh, we're seeing glaciers that are surging 15 miles a day. Um, with the ice melt, uh, we're now beginning to see for the first time the rise of the sea level because of the melting ice. I've also experienced and lived with and traveled with the Inuit culture for the last 30 years and seen the impact on their lives as the ice uh, disintegrates. We are now uh, witnesses ourselves of this climate change. We're at 400 parts per million right now as I'm speaking and rising. And uh, we're witnessing a severe drought, uh, continuing drought in California. Uh, we just recently had a biblical flood in Texas. And as we speak, Alaska is on fire and drought. So we have these extreme weather events all around us that we are now very familiar with. It's a moral imperative that we reduce our carbon emissions. And the Clean Power Plant uh, provides us with a roadmap uh, to reduce our emissions and in the same time, building our clean energy economy. Um, I spoke to uh, the governor yesterday, um, asked him if he could come to the event. Unfortunately, he had a commitment today. He sends his apologies. But I know the governor um, is committed to the Clean Power Plan. It aligns with his strategy to move Minnesota away from coal. But however, we must encourage the governor and our elected officials to take an aggressive move here to reduce our carbon uh, to create a, a cleaner environment for our children and ourselves, and they're also to build this clean energy economy that will rise us, raise us out of poverty in the inner city. It has this potential. So thank you so much today for this opportunity. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Will Steger, and thank you for that special message from the governor. Very much appreciated. Um, and maybe when we get to the Q&A, we can talk about what happened in the legislature this year, because there are certainly opponents of the Clean Power Plan, which are outside of the state interests that we believe are trying to stop clean energy future development in Minnesota. But we can talk about that in a moment. We have two business leaders here who are our next speakers. They're both named John. The first one is J-O-H and John. John Brand is the CFO of Jewel Energy, um, which has properties and, and key employees across Minnesota. John Brand happens to be based in Chanhassen. So please welcome John Brand. Thank you, Jay. Jewel Energy uh, has a, a CEO, Dan Jewel, that's been well known in the clean energy circles here in Minnesota. He had a, an eye well into the 80s and 90s about reducing carbon emissions and using clean energy forms. In Minnesota, you may or may not be aware that we have a resource in Minnesota called the wind, and you can harvest it for free. And so Dan has chosen to uh, locate here in Minnesota and with the support of others, uh, we've now grown a company over 50 employees that essentially develops and owns wind farms here in Minnesota. And from that uh, vision that he's had about reducing carbon emissions using clean energy, um, it's helpful to know that we operate with what we call a concept called FEW, F-E-W-W, -W, which means that if you adopt clean energy, you're using no fuel, no emissions, using no water, and incurring no waste. And that's important to recognize as we talk today about the Clean Power Plan and how uh, we're here because we want to reduce carbon emissions and alternative forms of energy are certainly a way to do that. We're proud of what Minnesota has been able to accomplish with the efforts of Dan and many others in the state. We have now uh, have at least 15,000 jobs in Minnesota related to the clean energy uh, circles. And it's important to recognize the economic benefits too that these projects can bring to Minnesota as we adopt philosophies that allow the ratepayer dollars paid to utilities to be turned back to uh, those people leasing land and, and, and building in local ownership in these projects. So there's an economic benefit both in jobs and money that can uh, stay within the state. So we're proud of all that. 
We at Jewel Energy support the Clean Power Plan. It's uh, something that it is our hope that the state of Minnesota maximizes the benefits associated with the principles laid out in the plan. We hope that the, the governor and, and all the staff and commissions accordingly act where we can see the economic benefits in the future from uh, jobs increases and just the uh, jobs alone from construction over the next uh, 20 years is deemed to be uh, 35,000 jobs with maybe a couple billion dollars worth of construction. So here we are in Minnesota, maybe using up to 35, 40% of our electricity needs uh, generated from coal. We'd like to see the state maximize efforts to reduce that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Brand. Great example of how we in Minnesota, by virtue of our great policies, have distributed jobs across many counties in Minnesota. Our next speaker is another John J-O-N. John Kramer is the CEO of Sundial Solar, based in Edina, Minnesota. When I was chatting with him earlier today, he mentioned that over a year ago, before the Clean Power Plan was announced, he knew that it would be good for business in Minnesota. So John Kramer. Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> my name doesn't have an H. I don't know what happened with my parents, but you know, can't choose your parents. I'm John Kramer, CEO of Sundial Solar. We're based in South Minneapolis. We do work all over the world, but most of our work is based right here in Minnesota. In 2010, Sundial had one employee. By the end of this year, we expect to have 36. You do the math. You'll see that we've doubled in size every year since 2010. And although we may not be able to continue such exponential growth, the fact is that we will continue on that path as long as Minnesota expands into the clean energy future. And it will. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about our story. It's about growing jobs with excellent pay. It's about employees who love their work and give back to their communities. It's about a company that believes in making a difference, and it's about the smile on the faces of all the clients when we turn on that solar system. But the real beauty is this isn't a fantasy. This is reality. It's here and it's now. It's the solar industry, and it's not going away. Minnesota has no fossil fuels. We import nearly all of our energy needs. Almost two-thirds of our electricity comes from burning coal. Do you know how much coal that is? Well, I'm going to tell you. If you took all the coal that Minnesota burns in one month and put it into a single coal train, it would extend from here to Duluth. Think about that. It's a 125 mile long coal train every month. Month after month, year after year. No matter what the coal lobby would tell you, there's no such thing as clean coal. It's a farce of the highest order. You cannot dig coal in a clean way. You cannot transport coal in a clean way. And while you might be able to filter out some of the nasties while you burn the coal, the resultant ash is anything but clean. Coal is a fossilized business model that needs to be reburied. We need to stop the coal trains and break the coal chains. The Clean Power Plan is our next step to do just that by focusing our efforts on cutting carbon emissions statewide. Minnesota has a huge abundance of the most important energy source on the planet, and we all know what that is. It's sunshine. Right here in the Twin Cities, we get more sunshine than Jacksonville, Florida, or Houston, Texas. It's a fact, and it's time we recognize that. The time has come to trade a dirty, outdated business model of the past for a clean, modern, healthy energy future. I'm here today to thank the legislature and the governor for reinforcing policies that support the clean energy future. 
This legislative session wasn't easy, but some of them stood fast in maintaining the programs that started us down a shiny new path. But it's time to take that next step, the clean power step. Cutting carbon pollution is good for all Minnesotans, and it's good for business, from the farmers on the plains to the fish camp up in the Boundary Waters. With the Clean Power Plan, our state can transition to a brighter future. We can do it sensibly. We can do it sustainably. Most of all, we can do it with the knowledge that our children will live happier, healthier lives on a greener planet. And sometime in the future, they might actually thank us. Thank us for taking that next step to stop the coal trains and break the coal chains. We can do it, and we shall. Thank you. Thank you, John Kramer from uh, Sundial. In addition to Andy Kim and Tim Goulden, who I've already introduced, we have also joining us, not able to speak at the podium today, but able to answer your questions afterwards, Chris Kunkel, who is the Regional Policy Manager for Wind on the Wires. So there are a number of businesses that are uh, ready to attest to the benefits of a strong, clean power plan in moving us ever farther forward. When we opened this press conference, I mentioned that the clean power plan is a tried and true tool under the Federal Clean Air Act. It's important to know two things about the Federal Clean Air Act. It is about protecting human health and welfare, and it has now been around for 45 years. It was first signed into law by a Republican, Richard Nixon, in 1970. 20 years later, in 1990, it was completely revamped and reinvigorated to reflect current medical literature and health science and make sure we were fully protecting Americans. I'm very pleased to say that every member of Minnesota's congressional delegation in 1990, there were 10 of them at the time, five Republicans and five Democrats, it's the way we tend to do things in Minnesota, all 10 of them voted to improve the Clean Air Act in 1990. So Congress has definitely acted on this one. Our next speaker, very appropriately, is from the American Lung Association in Minnesota. I well remember a year ago when the Clean Power Plan draft was announced, the very first national organization to weigh in and support and draw the connection between climate protection and human health protection was the National American Lung Association. So I'm very pleased to introduce Robert Moffitt, who is the communications director for the American Lung Association in Minnesota. Robert. Thank you, Jay. Well, as Jay suggested, the uh, health risks of climate change are too often overlooked. These include the increased likelihood of air pollution, uh, heat-related illness, and also the extreme weather uh, conditions that Will mentioned, the droughts, the floods, the excessive rains. Uh, in addition to this, there's also the spread of infectious diseases from animals and vectors we've never seen in Minnesota before, but are starting to move northward. Not only does climate change harm human health, it challenges our ability to respond to these health uh, risks. These impacts to public health require even more response from a medical and public health system that is already overstretched and under-resourced. Reducing carbon pollution from power plants will help us fight climate change, but it also has an important co-benefit because when we reduce carbon, we also reduce the traditional air pollutants that we know are harmful to human health. And I'm talking about particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxides, mercury, ozone, particulate matter. All of these pollutants will be reduced if the Clean Air Plan is introduced. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that the proposed carbon protection limits will prevent more than 150,000 asthma attacks in this country and more than 6,000 premature deaths every year when fully implemented. Our nation needs Minnesota's leadership in clean energy. We call on the state to develop a strong compliance plan to meet the Clean Air Act targets for carbon reduction from power plants and to ensure that the air we breathe is healthy. Minnesota is well positioned to develop a power plan
that is not only cleaner, more sustainable, but protects the health of all Minnesotans. That's a plan we can all breathe easier with. Thank you. Thank you to Robert Moffitt. This Clean Power Plan is a federal initiative that has been open and transparent to ideas from all across Minnesota and the United States. In the year that it was out for public comment, the Environmental Protection Agency got a record four million comments in support of the Clean Power Plan. And according to my latest reckoning, 95,126 of those comments came from Minnesotans. I know I was at several of those EPA hearings, and many of the voices speaking out were young people. So I'm delighted to introduce next Ms. Kendra Radel. Kendra, um, in the fall, will be an incoming senior at South High School in Minneapolis. She is a climate generation leader, and I'm sure she will describe to you what Yamin the topic of her cool t-shirt is going forward. Please join us, Kendra. <coughs> well, hello, uh, I'm Kendra Riedel, and I'm co-chair of Climate Generations um, High School Chapter, YAMIN, which stands for the Youth Environmental Activists of Minnesota. Um, and as a representative of today's youth, I'm here to urge Governor Dayton and his administration to move forward with implementing the Clean Power Plan in our state. As someone who is 16 years old, 14 of the 15 hottest years have all occurred in my lifetime. This shows as a young person, we're jeopardizing my past, present, and future. This goes for everyone in my generation and those to come. There are two harmful polluters within two blocks of my school, and close to 2,000 students spend their time there from August to June. These carbon emissions contain pollutants that are making us and everyone in the community sick. And that's a big deal and why I believe it's so urgent and important to take action towards decreasing these impacts. Uh, because the impacts of climate change are happening right now, have been happening, and will only continue to do so if we don't take action. The Clean Power Plan is the biggest step the United States has taken to mitigate climate change, and we need to make sure Minnesota leads the way in implementing a strong version of the plan. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kendra. Isn't it nice to see people of, from all generations and from many parts of Minnesota coming together in support of this Clean Power Plan? I'll tell you what's going to happen next on the Clean Power Plan. The draft rules came out on June 2nd of 2014. They are, um, the Environmental Protection Agency is now finalizing their scrutiny of all the comments they got and all of the discussions they've had uh, with, um, with stakeholders from throughout the country and they will be issuing the final standards we expect in late July or early August of this year. And that will start a timeline for every state to be in the driver's seat, which is a great place to be. So there's a national standard, every state will have a target. Minnesota, like every other state, will have the ability to develop a cost-effective compliance plan, a state plan for Minnesota over the next year or so, to submit to the Environmental Protection Agency that builds on tried and true policies and practices. Two things to bear in mind. Minnesota is already on track to meet the Clean Power Plan standards, and that is because we have a strong renewable energy standard and energy efficiency resource standard that we have met ahead of schedule and more aggressively um, than we needed to. Um, but we really did need to meet it very aggressively because climate change, as Will Steger has described, demands urgent action. So Minnesota is proof positive that a state can cost effectively create excellent paying jobs <laughs> and cut carbon very aggressively. So we think that the state will build on that. Fresh energy is one of, I think at the, our last stakeholder meeting convened every <coughs> month by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which is the responsible federal agency. Um, Every month they meet, and the last meeting had 144 stakeholders in the room. Anyone is welcome. It's a completely open and transparent process, although the state agency working with the Minnesota Department of Commerce, our energy agency, will actually draft up the plan. So that is what is going to happen going forward, and um, I'd love to open up the microphone now for specific questions that reporters have. Um, please let folks know if there's a particular entity that you'd like to address your question to. Who has the first question? For Minnesota to implement their clean power plan, is this a policy only issue or would there need to be some appropriations as well coming out of 2016? 
There's so much flex, and thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of flexibility that's built into clean power plan state plan development, and so we don't know exactly what that will look like for Minnesota. Um, if, if Minnesota stays on the route of um, standards that apply across the board to all utilities that have created the clean energy jobs, um, then we can build on that and we wouldn't need new appropriations. In fact, what the reason we're meeting those standards ahead of schedule is that the price of wind energy and solar energy has come down so dramatically in the marketplace that it is now able to compete very effectively in many cases against fossil fuels. So we won't know the answer to that until we start digging, digging into the details of the plan. Other questions, please, for the speakers. Will, when's your next venture? <laughs> well, well, the venture right now is the clean power plan. So um, you're going to head off to the cold weather again? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be heading out again next uh, winter in the, in the fall, in Where? the spring. Well, I'm up in Ca uh, southern Canada. I'm doing trips up there and keeping current, keeping exercise, but keeping my eye on the ball here with the climate plan. Well, uh, you've, been, uh, you've been all over the top of the world. Is this uh, irreversible or is it too late? Uh, what, what's going to happen here? Yeah, it's a combination. We're, we're going to have to adapt to the changes because I don't see um, the Arctic Ocean, you know, the ice there are changing. Uh, so we have to adapt, but we have to move uh, as quickly as possible. And that's why the urgency here of getting this clean power plant moving to reduce, reduce the carbon and then to adapt to what's coming. There are still a lot of cynics uh, concerning global warming and whether or not humans really have an impact on it. And some of those cynics are in the Minnesota legislature. How do you address their concerns as you try to move forward? Yeah, it's difficult, and, and this, is, uh, this is the challenge here, and this is why we're not moving ahead, because there is still denial of the science, and the science is in by at least 97%. And that's politics. It's not always completely rational, and it's funded also in certain arenas, and that's the reason why we have some problems like this. But it, it is a major problem. It's a major setback for our younger generation and the future, I, I feel, of the world. So we need, we need to be aggressive on this ourselves and get, get these plans passed and work the best we can. I think we can work in the direction of the economy. I mean, we, we might agree to disagree on the science, and that's fine, but um, we have to look at, uh, as our speaker spoke here, the number of jobs that we're creating. We can approach this economically because reducing, reducing carbon means in increasing our economy, building our economy. So that's how I work with. Uh, people that deny the facts. I, I uh, respect the person, but I, I look at it economically. I would also note that in the week that this draft plan came out last year, there was nationwide polling done by ABC News and the Washington Post and with Minnesota breakout numbers. And one of the questions in the poll was, do you want the federal government to set guidelines and limits on coal plant pollution? 70% of respondents in Minnesota said yes. They wanted federal limits. In addition, an identical number of respondents, 70%, said they also wanted state limits. So um, it may be time for lawmakers as they go back to their districts to talk to their constituents because there is a majority, very strong majority across Minnesota that wants both state and federal limits to protect human health. You had a question? Mr. Question? Moffitt from the Lummi uh, Agency. Yes. Uh, how, how can someone reverse the effects of this in their atmosphere, in their environment, for, uh, is this a public health risk? It is a public health risk, and once air pollution occurs, you really can't reverse it. That's why it's so important to get out and try to prevent it, to get out and try to make our air quality as clean as possible. Here in Minnesota, we've been fortunate to be within federal guidelines for air quality standards, but the more we learn about the science of air pollution, the more we realize that uh, air pollution is much more dangerous at lower levels than previously known. And there's a, a proposed water facility for the city of Minneapolis that's happening that seems to be moving progress towards being implemented in the same neighborhood as climate generation. Can you speak to what effects that might have on a neighborhood, uh, another increased water facility? I really couldn't speak on, on water. Uh, air is more of our forte. Thank you. Yeah, we probably don't have the right experts here uh, to answer that question. Other questions, please? Uh, yes, yes, for Kendra. Mm -hmm. um, 
how difficult is it uh, for you to uh, sort of motivate your peers to get as involved in this as you are? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's much easier to motivate my peers than it is to motivate the older generations because I think we all know that this is something that's happening right now and it's only going to keep doing that. And so, um, and you know, the younger generations are like more known to be more progressive. So I, there's very few climate deniers, climate change deniers. And um, so, yeah, it's much easier to motivate my peers. And also we like, it, a lot of it is about economics and about jobs. And we know that's something that we're gonna have to worry about soon. The Clean Air Act on which the Clean Power Plan is based was put into law because of actions that young people took in the first Earth Day of 1970. So those strong voices calling for action are born out. And I would remind people in 2007 when the Minnesota legislature passed the Next Generation Energy Act and our renewable energy standard with 91% of legislators voting for these bills, a lot of the testimony for the Next Generation Energy Act, as you might imagine, was from young people who were talking about where they wanted their power to come from when they were the age of those seated legislators. And it was very effective, and we urge legislators to continue talking to young people and get great ideas from them. Rita. How are you reaching out or communicating with groups, communities of color, people of color? It doesn't seem that there's a lot of representation here or at other meetings that I've been to uh, from those communities. Oh, for once. Oh, please. Uh, that's a very good point. Seeing as how they're uh, most, more affected by climate change and pollution than uh, the uh, other class. That's something that I think um, in our industry, we've taken it very seriously. Um, most of the people in the room that are related to the solar industry are, are very concerned about uh, making this transition from what is the, what you would consider the the fossilized energy plan to a clean energy plan. Um, and we take, that, we take that concern very seriously, but we, we broaden it out, not just to worry about jobs and you know, some coal plant, but what about, what about folks from the inner city? Um, for example, uh, one of my better friends is a, a guy named Jamez Staples, and you may, you may know Jamez. Um, his whole life revolves around bringing people up, disadvantaged people of color, mostly from the north, uh, north side of, of town, but, but from anywhere. And we are partnering with Jamez um, to create a program to train inner city people, and it doesn't matter what color they are, um, to, to get into the solar industry. We have a lack of talent in our industry. I've had ads on Craigslist and and you know, um, in the newspapers and stuff, I need people, but I need people that have a, a certain you know base level of training. So we take it seriously, and and we look to people like Jamez and and others that have um, programs. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to install solar. We're happy to support the training. Let's bring all the people that are interested in a good job. And I will say we have very excellent pay. Our average pay in, in, of employees, and I'm not talking um, upper staff, $31 an hour, not including benefits.